I'd like to welcome you all to the Michael and Rebecca Bogan Lecture Series. This is our inaugural um, lecture. Uh, I'd like to thank the Bogans for that gift. Um, it's going to mean a lot to our department and our students. Um, I'd like to thank Department Head Sadek Artun for being very supportive um, of us uh, uh, searching out uh, for people to come uh, speak. Uh, the, the lecture committee, um, Corey Gallo, I think I saw him here. Dr. Tim Shawalker is here. Um, Peter Summerlin, I haven't seen him yet. He's on sabbatical. A sabbatical, so uh, we may not see him for a while. Uh, I want to thank Bob Ruzek for helping us get out the, uh, the information uh, to, to different groups. Um, and I'd like to thank the uh, student chapter of ASLA um, for also helping to get uh, information out and they'll help, they're going to help uh, with lunch tomorrow after the 1130 lecture. Um, <clears throat> so um, tonight we've got Dr. Douglas Talley, uh, who is here from the University of Delaware. Um, thank you for coming to Mississippi State University and uh, being a part uh, of, of this lecture series for us. Um, he's the author of best-selling books, Nature's Best Hope, The Nature of Oaks, Bringing Nature Home. Um, he's also uh, part of a, or has a website, uh, homegrownnationalpark.org, that hopefully he'll talk about a little bit. A little bit. Um, where you can go and look at mapping your own, uh, where you have native plants in your yard, uh, and other, uh, look at other resources there as well. So I know you didn't come to hear me for sure, so I'm going to go ahead and let's welcome Dr. Tower. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tate. Ooh, this is nice. Wow. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here, and I'm happy I'm here because Dollar Rent a Car didn't want me to be here. They had no car for me. Um, you know, people, people say, gee, you only talk to the choir. I say, well, it's only the choir who invites me. But when I get an invitation from Landscape Architects, they're typically not the choir. I say, yeah, I've got to do that. So I want to give you my idea of what Nature's Best Hope is. But before I do that, I want to talk about this book, Half Earth, Half Earth by uh, E.O. Wilson. You, if you don't know, he's, uh, he died the day after Christmas. Um, one of the most impactful scientists of all times, but certainly of our time. Wonderful entomologist, wonderful ecologist, wonderful conservationist, uh, and we're going to miss him dearly. But throughout his very long career, he was trying to save life on planet Earth. He loved biodiversity, wrote books about it, and this is what he wrote in, in 2016, Our Planets uh, Fight for Life. Uh, and his, his message was very simple. He said, if we're going to save life anywhere on Earth, we have to save it on at least half of planet Earth. We have to have nature on half of the Earth, functioning ecosystems on half of the Earth. Otherwise, it's going to disappear everywhere. And he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that statement. And then he ended the book. He didn't spend a lot of time talking about how we might do that. Of course, that message to conservation biologists is, is great. Well, we'll just put half the Earth aside. But you know, half the Earth is in, in some form of agriculture, half of terrestrial Earth. And we've got 8 billion people and all of our detritus and, and airports and dollar rental cars and everything else in the other half. And we don't have a third half for nature. So people are scratching their heads. As attractive as the idea is, everybody's scratching their heads. How are we going to do that, EO? Well, I think we can realize his dream, but we need a new, a new approach to conservation. The old approach isn't going to work. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, for the most part. But before I do that, I want to talk about an oak mast that we had, uh, particularly in the east. You might have had it here in Mississippi in 2019. All the members of the Red Oak Group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And that's what it looked like in a lot of places. Very impressive. Well, I'm easily entertained, so I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it. And I was rewarded. An insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First, it chewed a little hole for its head. And it started to force its head through there. And it forced its entire body through that hole. It was a tight squeeze. Made it look like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Finally, it plopped down. That's a dangerous sign for that insect because everything wants to eat it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface in about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber, converts itself to a pupa. And then it stays there for two years. After two years, comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses. 
because it looks like they do, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule, and the mouth parts are way down there at the end of that extension. And they use those mouth parts to chew a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in it, and that's how the larva gets down there. We might wonder why they spend two years underground before they come out as an adult, like most insects would. Um, it's because red oak acorns take 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough egg acorns for them. Of course, once they leave the acorn, it leaves a hole, a true vacuum. You know that nature abhors a vacuum, and in this case, she has filled it with three species of Temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in the holes made by acorn weevils after they've left the acorn. And if scouts find a new hole in a new acorn, they get all excited because their old acorn's falling apart. So they go back and they tell everybody it's time to move. They grab the larvae, they grab the eggs, they move the entire colony into the new acorn in about 30 minutes. Then they post a guard right there, make sure nobody else comes in, and that's where they'll live for the next two years until that acorn falls apart. What's my point with this story? That's just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions that comprise the bulk of nature, largely interactions between animals and plants. This is another one, the relationship between jays and oaks. Jays are the primary disperser of oak acorns, and they'll fly up to a mile from the parent tree and then tap that acorn beneath the soil surface. Now they're going to go get it during the wintertime, have something to eat. But for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one is. So for every four acorns they bury, they have planted three oak trees. Specialized interaction between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. That's what they rear their young on, carpenter ants. So you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have a lot of carpenter ants, and you won't have a lot of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have phacelia. That is the only pollen, the only plant that that bee can rear its young on. We've got about 4,000 species of native bees in, in this country, and over a third of them are highly specialized just like this. They can only reproduce in the pollen of particular plants. You won't have the Baltimore checker spot unless you have white turtle head. I could talk all night, all week, all year about nature specialized relationships. But the point I want to make is that these relationships, nature itself, are now on the ropes. And they're on the ropes because we didn't take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over its beautiful view, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we didn't leave it as it was. There's only about 5% of the lower 48 states that's anything close to its original pristine ecological state. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We've grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland in this country. That's four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cattle. And of course, we've paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them, and you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the amount of nature that we need to run the ecosystems that we all depend on. Why have we done this? I don't know. I suspect we thought the Earth, our nest, was so big, we could foul it forever, and there wouldn't be any consequences. Of course, we were wrong about that, and that's why we're seeing some pretty scary headlines these days, like the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one. North America has lost three billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. It's almost a third of our, our bird population, already gone. And now the UN says, well, we're going to lose a million species to extinction, probably in the next 20 years. I don't know if you, you heard a couple months ago, they said we've removed 23 species from the endangered species list, not because uh, we've saved them, but because they're already extinct. So this is, this is happening, but it's something we can't allow to continue to happen, because we depend on these species. We really do. So I could go on talking about the, the pox that we humans have, have delivered upon the environment, us upon all of our houses, but that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from a lot of people, people like you and me, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here, what does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, back to E.O. Wilson. He told us what it would mean if Earth lost its insects, and he did it in a paper way back in 1987 called The Little Things That Run the World. 
And again, his, his message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial uh, habitats, ecosystems, that the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, many of our freshwater fishes, those food webs would collapse and all those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is, is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There is some good news here, folks, and that is that none of that has to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're gonna have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. And that's where you guys come in. Why is that? Remember, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on the life support that healthy ecosystems deliver. We call them ecosystem services. These are just a few things that plants do that we humans benefit from. Everybody, everything benefits from them. But they produce oxygen, that's pretty important. They clean water, slow its journey to the sea where it's too salty to use. Carbon capture, enormously important today. Plants, of course, are built out of, out of carbon that they've gotten from carbon dioxide. They pull it out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, build their tissues out of it. But then what, what most people don't uh, appreciate is they're also pumping extra carbon into the soil through their roots. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plants have stored in, in the soils over the, the eons. A third of the carbon that's in the atmosphere right now has come from us chopping down our forests and removing plants. So it's a lot of carbon. If we put those plants back, we could, we could pull it back out. Plants are, are building topsoil, holding it in place. They're preventing floods. They're dampening severe weather. They're converting sunlight into food. If we lost our plants, we'd have to eat sunlight. That will be hard. What do animals do for plants? They provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of those flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services is just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but today it's a terrible idea because of all the people that demand more services now than ever before, that eight billion people. <clears throat> now we do have parks and we've got preserves and they're doing the best they can, but there's too few of them and they're too small, which means now we're gonna have to practice conservation, increase the, the ecosystem function on landscapes outside of parks and preserves. That's where we live, where we work, where we farm, where we play, all of those places. Now, there have been visionaries through the ages who have, have uh, knew that we needed to, we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet Earth. And Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said is the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. There have been indigenous groups that have been able to do that for long periods, but our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than, than uh, it has to offer, completely wrecking an area, going to another area, doing the same thing. Clearly unsustainable behavior. <clears throat> but Allo had, had uh, a lot of faith in humans. He believed we could develop what he called a land ethic. He knew we had to use the earth. We had to farm and lumber and graze and do all of those things. But he, he believed that we could learn to do them gently enough so we did not uh, uh, ruin ecosystems. And that's what he called developing a land ethic, and he wrote about it in Sand County Almanac, Almanac his, his most famous book. What he did not write about, though, was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time, that notion was so deeply embedded in the, the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, it's still embedded in our own culture that he may not have recognized that it was actually an option. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Not only is, is living with nature an option these days, I, I believe it's the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head. We need to practice conservation, save nature, reconstruct it where there are a lot of people, because that's pretty much everywhere. In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes. Not hang on by a thread, but thrive. Where should we start? Let's go back to private property. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. 85.6% of the, of the U.S. east of the Mississippi is privately owned. 
I think it's 98% of Texas is privately owned. If we don't do conservation on private property, we're going to fail because all those other areas are too small and too isolated. Now, when I use the word conservation, I'm, I'm not using it correctly. We do want to conserve any places that are, are relatively pristine and, and are not already destroyed. We certainly want to conserve those. But what we're really talking about is a form of restoration. We want to rebuild ecosystems wherever we can. Now, I know they're not going to look exactly the way they did before we dismantled them. Um, but we'll do the best we can. What we want to do is reunite as many of those specialized relationships that are nature as we can. And that will recreate ecosystem function, even if it's not exactly what was at that place 500, 600 years ago, whatever. But in order to, to rebuild ecosystems, you have to start with the building blocks. Not all species contribute to ecosystems equally. So we have to start with, with the most important ones. Then we'll add the others later on. And there's two groups we can't do without. One is the flowering plants and the insects that uh, allow them, the pollinators that allow them to reproduce. They, of course, are capturing energy from the sun and through photosynthesis, turning it into food and storing it in their parts, mostly their leaves. So now we've got, we've got essentially all the food that drives life on terrestrial earth stored in plant parts. Now we have to get it to animals. Most vertebrates do not eat plants directly. Most vertebrates eat invertebrates that ate those plants. Those invertebrates are typically insects. And it turns out that caterpillars are enormously important. They are transferring more energy from plants to other animals, other, other organisms, than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars, we're going to have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. And of course, that's a, that's a new goal. For, for designing landscapes to make caterpillars. I haven't thought of it in that, that way in the past. Let me give you an uh, idea, an example from uh, Carolina chickadees. That's the chickadee you have down here. It's the chickadee I have up in Pennsylvania, believe it or not. Um, they're the birds at our feeders all winter long. And we tend to think that's what they need, seeds. Well, even in the wintertime, only 50% of their diet is seeds. The other 50% is insects and spiders, even in the, the wintertime. But when they're reproducing, their babies can't eat seeds. And that's typical for most of the birds that are out there. They can't eat seeds. So they switch entirely to insects. And if they're in a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And in fact, they are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds rear their young on insects. And most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? There's a number of lines of evidence that suggest that. But this is a citizen science project that one of my students did a few years ago, Ashley Kennedy. She put out a call to bird photographers across the country saying, please take pictures of birds during the breeding season when they're carrying food to the nest. Send those pictures to me. I will identify all the prey items in the beaks of the birds and reconstruct the nestling diets for as many species of birds in North America as possible. And what you're looking at is a summary of her, her results. The green bars are the percentage of nestling diets in the 20 most common bird families that was caterpillars. <clears throat> and in 16 out of the 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the nestling diet. So again, what would happen if we design landscapes that don't have enough caterpillars? Most of our birds would not be able to reproduce. Well, why caterpillars? What's special about caterpillars? There's a number of things special about caterpillars. One of them is that they are, they are soft. Think of this guy as if he's a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is its exoskeleton. It's, it's made of chitin. It's undigestible, so the birds don't want a lot of that. And because they're soft, you can stuff it down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring them. And if you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, they're pretty rough. Their beak is like a plunger. They really do this stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also a relatively large prey item. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. And some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around. But do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar. They're nutritious, very high in fat, very high in protein, very low percentage of chitin of exoskeleton compared to many other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages, they're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is, is undigestible. And a lot of beetles have sharp edges too. You don't want to stuff that down your, your offspring's throat. Finally, it turns out the caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now I mentioned carotenoids, not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate. You're a vertebrate. Birds are vertebrates. We vertebrates don't make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get our carotenoids from plants. And we have to get them from plants because uh, carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. 
Where are the birds getting their carotenoids from? During the breeding season, they're getting them from the prey items they're feeding their babies, of course. But look, carotenoid content is not equally distributed across bird prey items. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of bird prey. Here are the adult caterpillars. Here are the moths and butterflies themselves. They have far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. It's just the caterpillars eating the green leaves. And here's the earthworm way down here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So that study and several others uh, strongly suggest that caterpillars are not optional parts of bird diets. They're essential parts of bird diets. So let's just say birds need caterpillars. The next question is, how many caterpillars do they need? Is one or two enough or one or two a day enough? Let's go back to chickadees. Got a lot of data on chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands, depending on the number of chicks in the nest, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get them to the point where they leave the nest. I'm talking about one nest. One nest of a bird that is a third of an ounce, four pennies worth of bird. And after they fledge, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 21 days. So you're really talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars required to get one clutch of chickadees to independence. And after they're independent from their parents, they keep eating caterpillars. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, you've got to have all these caterpillars in your yard. They're only foraging about 50 meters from the nest. They are not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. Why not? That spends way more energy than they would get from foraging in that, that woodlot. And if we don't landscape in a way that makes all those insects, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline is one of the major causes of the bird declines that we're measuring. By we, I mean the Rosenberg et al. group, the Smithsonian group that, that uh, says we lost three billion birds in the last 50 years. We, we looked at their original data set, just the terrestrial birds, <coughs> and divided them into two groups. The species that require insects at some part of their life history, typically when they're breeding, and the species that don't require insects when they're breeding. The doves and the finches that can actually reproduce on seeds. They make a little milk out of their seeds and feed that to their babies. And the ones that don't require insects didn't lose any numbers at all in the last 50 years. But the birds that do require insects lost, on average, 10 million individuals per species. It doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly does suggest that as you take bird food away, you lose birds. So there you go. We got a new goal for landscaping now. We do want to make beautiful landscapes. We want them to make, make them functional for humans, but they also have to be functional for everything else. So in the long run, we're, they're functional for humans. Um, so we're going, to add, we're going to add ecological function to our, our landscaping goals, including supporting caterpillars. How do we design landscapes that support a lot of caterpillars? Well, you add caterpillars to landscapes by putting the plants that support those caterpillars in the landscape. And that seems easy enough, but there is a catch, and that is that most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about it. We have to be fussy about our plant choice, and we have to be fussy about it because the caterpillars themselves are fussy about it. Let's use the monarch butterfly as a perfect example. Have you thought about this? You know you're not going to have monarch butterflies if your landscape has hostas and calorie pear and burning bush and barberry <coughs> and camellias and all the things we landscape with from Asia. You're not going to have monarchs because the only thing they can eat, the only thing they will develop on is milkweeds. That's called host plant specialization. And it turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. If they don't have the plants they have specialized on, they are gone. Why are they host plant specialists? Because plants have made them that way. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals. Secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. Every plant lineage that's out there protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. And, and the insect species can't adapt to all of them. So they pick one or two lineages that are really similar in how they protect themselves and they develop the adaptations necessary to get around those particular defenses. They develop specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, specialized behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize the insect's exposure 
to those compounds. It takes a long period of history with those particular plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. It doesn't happen overnight. <clears throat> and once they do fall into place, the insect is locked into eating that particular group of plants. So that's why if you take the milkweeds out of your yard and put in hostas, the monarch doesn't start to eat hostas. The only thing it can eat is milkweeds. So it has two choices. It's going to find milkweed someplace else or it's going to starve to death and, and disappear. And that's why when we bring in plants from other continents, as beautiful as they are, they don't support local food webs because most of our insects are, are unable to take advantage of the nutrition in those plants. And if they escape and become serious invasive species, displacing native plants in our natural areas, then we ruin the food web in the natural areas as well. So all I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. The plants we choose to put in our human dominated landscapes, which are pretty much everywhere, will only support life, will only create functional ecosystems if we choose the right plants. Otherwise, it won't work. And I'm going to give you three examples of how well it does work when we do choose the right plants, starting with uh, my house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. I should say our house. My wife is there too. Um, this is what it looked like. We brought a, a farm that was broken up into 10-acre lots. It was a very old farm, been farmed for 300 years. So the soil was exhausted. And the last thing they did was mow it for hay. Uh, and when you, when you mow for hay, where I come from, you're mowing all the invasive plant roots, the autumn olive and multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and on and on and on. You call that hay. So that's what they did. Um, our goal was to rebuild the ecosystems where, where this farm uh, used to be. And in order to do that, we have to put the caterpillars back. So here's some examples of how, how that happened. I want to see if I could attract the Canadian outlet to our house. Not just come there, but make a living there. That's what the Canadian owl looks like. I'd never seen a Canadian owl. It's a cute little guy. And that's what the adult looks like, just like a leaf. Well, you're not going to have Canadian owlets unless you have meadow root. Just like you're not going to have monarchs unless you have milkweeds, this is host plant specialization. They require meadow root. And we didn't have any meadow root. I'm sure it was there hundreds of years ago, but long gone. The place had been farmed to death for centuries. So I got some seeds, planted some meadow root, grew really nicely. Uh, but, you know, this was early on. I actually had very little faith that any Canadian outlets were going to find my meadow roof, so I didn't even go out and check it for, it must have been two months after I planted it. And finally I walked by and it was covered with Canadian outlets. They had found it right away. I'm still surprised about that. Um, so, big success. So now we have a good population of, of meadow roof and a good population of Canadian outlets. We added two species to the property. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. This beautiful orange moth is uh, has nothing to do with goldenrod. That's a misnomer. It's a specialist on Biden's aristosa, ditch daisy. I did know where there was some Biden's in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I went and got some seeds, planted them at home. Had to wait a year for that moth to find my Biden's, but they did. And I've got a good population of both of those. So now we've added four species to the property. One of the hackberry emperor, not because it's the most it's beautiful butterfly in the world. It's, it's really not, but because it's a species that belongs there. And as its name suggests, it's a specialist on hackberry. We didn't have any hackberry. So I planted hackberry, had to wait four years for the butterflies to find my hackberry. But they finally did. I looked at one of my hackberry branches uh, in June last year, and there were nine hackberry emperor caterpillars on a single branch. So another big success. Now we've added six species. And that's how it went. I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own, and along with it came many of the things that specialize on goldenrod, like the beautiful brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparagonothus, the goldenrod gall moth. Now this is one that hasn't come, the goldenrod flower moth. I don't know why it hasn't come. That's, that's what its caterpillars look like. But this is, it's still part of the fun. This is anticipation. It's like waiting for the, the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year I go out and I look for the, the uh, caterpillars of the goldenrod flower moth. One of these years I'm going to find it, and that'll be a great day. I planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. I hear people don't like Virginia creeper. I just don't know why. It's a great native plant. It's got good fall color, good ground cover. It can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling them down. It makes valuable berries for the birds in the fall. They're very high in fat. That's what birds want from berries in the fall. Uh, it's also a great pollinator plant. Its flowers are tiny and inconspicuous. You won't even notice it's in flower until you see a cloud of bees around it. Remember, when you're making a pollinator garden, you're making it for the bees. So it's okay if the flowers aren't really showy. 
I planted it because it's the best host plant for the large sphinx moths that are a primary component of cardinal diets. Things like the Pandora sphinx, it's beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. One of the double tooth prominent, just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. I mean, even if you don't like caterpillars, you gotta like this guy. It's a specialist on elm, particularly American elm. Of course, we lost our American elms to Dutch elm disease decades ago. But the two big American elms at the University of Delaware that did not die, I got some seeds from those plants, planted them at home. They grew really nicely. So that was 19 years ago. Those trees are now 80 feet tall. And they brought in the double teeth prominent, another big success, American elm. One of the evening primrose moth, because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. Well. We didn't have any evening primrose, believe it or not, so I planted that, Enothera. The moth came, spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. It's very cute. And I planted lots of oaks. Now, those are just examples of the plants that we have put on our property. But I want to focus on oaks for a while because they're such important plants. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York. That's Martha Stewart land. People argue about whether uh, it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And I hear people say all the time, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right, it won't. But if you can enjoy what your oak is doing for your property, what is contributing to your local ecosystem, your local food web, you can enjoy it right away. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns. They were free. Or two foot bare root whips. They only cost $1.50 each. And immediately they started to rebuild the food web based on caterpillars by bringing in the moths that create those caterpillars. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow-shouldered moth, the uh, Suzuki's promolactus, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow-vested moth, the orange-tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two-spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red-humped oak worm, the orange-humped oak worm, the pink-striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the orange patch smoky wing, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laffer, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks at my house, and they come right away. This is the pinna that just popped its head above the leaves, and there's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that plant. So right away, the very first year, they're gonna start to support your local food web. This is what our house looks like. Uh, this is what it will look like this summer when all the leaves come out. Um, I'm standing in the same place I took the first picture, uh, so, um, we have a little lawn there, we're very, very traditional, but we put a lot of plants back. Certainly not all the plants that used to be there, but I'm still, still working on it. Uh, and over the years, since we moved in in the year 2000, I have learned how important caterpillars are to local ecosystems. So they're a very good measure of how you're doing in your restoration. So four, I guess it's almost five years ago now, I started to count all the species of moths that I have found at, at our house, taking a picture of. I haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. Uh, and I'm still at it with the moths, and I am up to 1,140 species of moths that are now making a living on this piece of property because we put the plants back. Now we've got 10 acres, Pennsylvania's 2.4 million acres, so on one 240 thousandths of the land area, we've got 44% of all the moths that occur in the entire state because we put the plants back. And because so many of those are types of bird food, we have recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our property. Not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? This is another headline we see all the time. World Wildlife Fund says that Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. These are pretty depressing statistics. But I'm thinking, gee, not at our house. I'm sure we've increased biodiversity by more than two thirds and it didn't take that long and it wasn't that hard. All we do is put the plants back. Remember, that's your job. You guys play with plants all the time. So don't, don't give up. I mean, these are scary headlines globally, but we can turn it around if we just realize what, what you need to start with, and that's the powerful plants. But now what you're thinking, we've got 10 acres, a lot of people don't have that much land, so will it work on smaller plots, particularly in suburbia? Let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house to answer that question. They live in Kirkwood, Missouri. In a typical neighborhood, all their, their neighbors have big lawns. And when they moved in, their yard was, was uh, choked with bush honeysuckle, another major invasive species. So they got rid of that. They planted 75 species of native plants, put in a water feature for the birds, and they sat back and started to count the birds that are using their yard. And they are up to 149 species, including 35 warbler species. 
If you know anything about bird watching, that's a good number for, for warblers. We've only recorded eight warbler species at our house. So does it work? Oh, by the way, they've got 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than, than Cindy and I have. So yes, it works on smaller properties. What about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, that little gray thing back there is one of the towers at, at O'Hare Airport. She lives right next to the airport. She's got one-tenth of an acre, three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. Kennedy Expressway is over here, not connected to any natural area at all. So she's a tiny island in Chicago. It's a pretty island, but she did the same thing. She got rid of her, her uh, invasive plants and put in 60 species of native plants, a little water feature for the birds. Then she started to count the birds that have come to her yard. I keep forgetting to fix this. It's 124 species of birds that she has seen, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Chicago, check out Pam's house. <laughs> All right, there's five things we need to think about if we're going to succeed in a big way. And we do want to succeed in a big way. And the first one is we've got to shrink the area that is in lawn. As of 2005, we had 40 million acres of lawn in this country. So you know it's more than that now. Um, 40 million acres is the size of New England, dedicated to an ecological deadscape. So I know we need lawn as a status symbol. We, you know, we humans are not going to give up our status symbols. And we need lawn to display our Halloween decorations. But what if we cut the area of lawn in half? What if we took places like this and turned them into this? This is, I got this, uh, people just send me slides. I like to use them. Dan Getman, whoever that is in Missouri, sent me this. He had a big lawn, and he decided to start to, to put as many natives back in his property as he can. Well, if we cut the area of lawn in half, that gives us 20 million acres. And if we do it at home, we can create a new national park that I'm calling Homegrown National Park. And it'll be big. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badland National Park, Olympic National Park, plus Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. You had a boldest park, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park would be the biggest park in the country. What do you get when you put a park at home? What do you get when you put some part of nature at home? You get the opportunity to develop a personal relationship with Mother Nature. Rekindle it if you had one when you were young, or if you never had one, developed it to start with. And you can do it at your own time, your own pace. All you have to do is go outside. Actually, all you have to do is look out the window. You can avoid crowds. If you go to a real national park, last summer, 375 million people there. So you know what that means. It's free, there's no admission fee. It's never closed, no matter what pandemic comes down the park. No, no travel hassles. You get to experience the natural world alone, which I think is, is critically important for developing that personal relationship, not mediated with, by somebody else. And it's really important for our poor kids. Richard Liu says they're, they're suffering from nature deficit disorder. So we're, we're trying. We get 30 kids, we put them on a bus with a the teacher, they drive for an hour, they walk around a natural area for an hour, and the teacher tells them not to touch anything. And they get back on the bus and they drive home. And that's their experience with the natural world, which I'm sure is better than nothing. But it's really been an experience with 30 other kids and the teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have some part of nature right where they live, they can go out and interact with it alone. No parental supervision. You know, if you supervise your kids in everything, it sends the message that everything is dangerous and scary. That's no way to connect with the natural world. They will come home again, I guarantee it. Why is this important? Because they are the future stewards of the planet. If they don't know that they're supposed to be stewards, if they don't know how to steward, if they don't love what they're stewarding, they're going to be lousy stewards. And we don't need any more lousy stewardship. And maybe they'll hunt, learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter who lives in Hawaii on a very modest patch of nature, a little piece of lawn with a hedge. But there are anole lizards there. And when she discovered that, she sent me this picture to describe how you hunt lizards. You get in the ground and cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards don't see you coming. Then you crawl towards the lizards very slowly. No smiling. This is serious business. You can wear your best dress, that's OK. But you sneak up on the lizard, you catch the lizard, you put it in an aquarium, you learn how to take care of the lizard. You fall in love with that part of nature. And you learn what good stewardship is. Now, I don't think her name is Zoe. I don't think Zoe is going to be crawling on the ground in her best dress, catching lizards the rest of her life. I don't think. She sent me this picture not long ago, so who knows. But I guarantee she's going to remember catching lizards in Hawaii. 
And I guarantee she's going to be a good steward of the planet because of those experiences. If you want your kids to do more than catch lizards, get Nancy Stranisti's Nature Play at Home. Dozens of examples of how to expose kids to the natural world. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, you can do it. HomegrownNationalPark.org. You go to this site, you register your property. It's free, by the way. Just your location and the amount of area that you are pledging to, to be a good steward of, the amount of area of lawn you're reducing. Maybe you've got a woodlot you're protecting. Any type of, of uh, ecological landscaping, you put that area on the map, and then your little part of your county is going to light up. And the object is to, to get the message that everybody, not just the choir, but everybody, in the future is responsible for good earth stewardship. That conservation is only going to work if everybody's involved. We want that message to go viral. So this is our attempt at, at social, using social media. So people can see, oh, you know, as, as more of the, the map lit up today, you know, as, as soon as we get through paying our, our uh, tech people, uh, it will light up. It's going to kind of look like the COVID map with different colors of, of all the counties. Um, but that's biodiversity value. Anyway, get yourself on the map. People say, are you, are you using our data? I don't even know what that means. Using it for what? Um, no, I don't even know what my password is. So, <laughs> Okay, we're going we're gonna to shrink the lawn. What plants are we going to put in the area that we take out of, of lawn? I'm going to argue that some of them have to be what I call keystone species. Remember what a keystone is. This is the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of the arch. If you take that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. Just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of those caterpillars that, that drive the food web. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillars that drive our food webs. So think of the, the uh, keystone plants in the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that are going to hold that house up. They're essential. Um, you know, you're not through building your house when you've got your keystone plants in, but, but you, can't, you can't build a, a, a successful ecosystem without them. We've been trying to build ecological houses with wallpaper for the last hundred years, and that just, just doesn't work. So the question is no longer simply, are natives better than non-natives ecologically? Um, on average, they, they certainly are. But <laughs> the real question is, should we landscape with plants that contribute to ecosystem function or not? There's a lot of plants that are pretty benign. They don't contribute anything. Invasive species actually de detract. They're, they're you know, the opposite of contribute. And those are the decisions we, we get to make. I used to get an email from, I don't know if it was one person or more than one person, that said, don't you know that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba, used to grow in North America 7 million years ago? That makes them native. That means we can plant them, and everything will be great. Yes, I do know that ginkgos grew in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native today, but I'm not going to have that argument because that's not the metric anymore. It's not whether they're native or not. It's whether they're doing anything or not. I don't care if ginkgos grew in the moon 7 million years ago. They produce zero caterpillars here today. They're occupying space but not contributing to your local landscape. What's contributing the most? Well, in 84% of the counties in which they occur, it's one of our oaks, genus Quercus. That's the top keystone plant. Uh, in the mid-Atlantic states, they support 557 species of, of caterpillars. That's where I live. 400 species in Harrison, Harrison County, is it? Or Harrisonville County? Somewhere here in Mississippi. Uh, 950 species nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes, comes close to that. So if you want to know where uh, you find the keystone, actually keystone genera, for uh, where you live, you go to Native Plant Finder. National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code, and the ranked list of both woody and herbaceous plants for your county will pop up. I spent a, a lot of time reworking this list so it would work for Mississippi, and I see I put the wrong talk up, so. But it's pretty close. The Quercus is, oh, number one. Your native prunus are very, very high. Your native willows are high. Uh, carrias, uh, hickories are, are very high. Um, otherwise, it, it looks the same. These are the most important uh, herbaceous plants. So notice I say native oaks, native cherries, native willows. If I go to the, the nursery and say, I want to buy a cherry, they're going to sell me an ornamental cherry from Asia, guaranteed. If I want to buy a willow, it's going to be a weeping willow from Turkey. 
If I want to buy a maple, it'll probably be a Japanese maple. You've got to specify that you want a native member of these very important genera, because if you don't, you, it's going to reduce caterpillar use by 68%. We've done that experiment. These are the top herbaceous genera, not only in terms of making caterpillars, but also in terms of supporting those specialist bees. Goldenrods are always way up there. The various genera that asters were broken up into, sunflowers, particularly perennial sunflowers. If you have those three groups of genera on your plants, on your landscape, you can support over 40 species of, of native bees that won't be there otherwise, because those are the only pollens that they can, they can use. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to invite a lot of uh, insects to our yard. And then we're going to kill them with our security light, which, of course, is not the goal. These are all the, the ways that light pollution at night is, is killing insects. It's one of the major causes of insect decline, unfortunately. Exhaustion, collisions, incineration, all of those things. Uh, but to me, this is actually good news. We've got to turn around insect decline. Insects are the little things that run the world. We've already lost 45% of them. If we can turn it around by flicking a switch, we're getting off easy. But I know what you're going to say. See all the lights we've got to turn off? It's a big, big job. You're going to say, well, I can't turn the light out over my garage or over my barn or over my front porch because the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on it so it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to notice is the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't want to do that, take the white bulb out of your security uh, system and put in a yellow bulb. A yellow LED is the best because yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to, to nocturnal insects, particularly moths, than our white wavelengths. If we take out the, the uh, white bulbs and put in yellow bulbs overnight, we'll save millions of insects and probably millions of dollars too if we use LEDs. Okay, we're going to, we're going to shrink the lawn, we're going to use keystone plants, we're going to turn out the lights, then we're going to invite Mosquito Joe to come kill all of our, our insects. Of course, people think, well, I'm just killing the mosquitoes, and that's what Mosquito Joe tells you. He also says it is uh, a natural product, and that makes it okay. It is a natural product. It's pyrethroids. It's, it's the same compounds that are in chrysanthemums. But cyanide is a natural product, too, but it doesn't make it OK. Uh, he also says it only kills mosquitoes. And I wish he was right about that. I really do. But in fact, it kills all the insects it comes in contact with. There were big monarch kills that flew through mosquito jail last year, two years ago. Hundreds of dead monarchs on the ground. I mean, look at this. It's covering everything. And it's a booming business around the country. What's interesting is it does not control mosquitoes. You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. In order to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you have to kill 90% of them. Mosquito Joe kills between 10 and 50%. So he's not even close to actually working. He's expensive. That's why he has to keep coming back and back and back. If you want to control mosquitoes, you do it in the larval stage. Get a bucket, fill it full of water, put a handful of straw or hay in your bucket. People say, how big a bucket? I don't care. Let it sit there for a couple of days. It's going to ferment and build up of algae and um, diatoms. That's what mosquito larvae eat. It makes an irresistible brew to mosquito females that are going to lay their eggs, ovipositing females. They lay their eggs in your bucket. Then you go to the hardware store and get a mosquito dunk. Sheet of mosquito dunk, it's $9 or something. And you put that in your bucket. Um, this is Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a natural bacterium, uh, and this formulation is only designed to kill aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic diptera in, in your bucket is a mosquito. So it's very targeted. If, if dragonflies get in there, it doesn't touch them. Uh, if, if your bird drinks it or your dog licks it up, no problem. You might put a coarse screen over it so your local chipmunk doesn't jump in and drown. But uh, this is targeted. It's cheap. Uh, only kills mosquitoes, and if everybody did it, you would really reduce your mosquito population. Fourth thing we need to do is to landscape in a way that allows caterpillars to complete their development. What am I talking about? Well, here's an example. I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillars eat the leaves, then they spin a cocoon and hang from one of the branches, then they emerge as an adult, then they do it all again. I wish everything did that, but most species don't. 94% of them, 480 of those species, finish growing as caterpillars on the leaves, and then they drop from the tree. And they wiggle their way beneath the soil surface and pupate underground. Or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. 
And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. We don't tolerate it. And we mow and compact our soils so that they're rock hard and those caterpillars can't get underground. So the way we typically landscape becomes an ecological trap. If we're using important plants, the, the moths, if there are any left, come in and lay their, their eggs there. The caterpillars develop and drop down and die. And I'm convinced this is another major cause of, of insect decline. And of course, the cement landscape is, is uh, um, not, not going to solve the problem either. This is what most people do. They have a tree in a yard. We're going to measure this, this summer how well caterpillars do in a situation like this. But I guarantee they do better in a situation like this. We've got a layered landscape. You've got the tree, maybe a dogwood here, native azalea, fern, ground cover. It's soft landing. The caterpillar drops down. It can easily get underneath the ground because the ground's not compressed. It's not compacted. Nobody's going to mow it. Nobody's going to step, step on it. Plenty of leaves down there for them to spin their cocoon in. Much higher survivorship. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening. We're not asking for less gardening here. We're asking for more. This is how you, you shrink the lawn. You put beds around all your trees. And all of a sudden, you've got less lawn. Safe sites. Liberally use your native ground covers, things like wild ginger and may apple and foam flower and ferns, all great safe sites. The fifth thing we need to do is be mindful of the possibility that we're creating ecological traps, particularly for birds. If we make attractive landscapes like this that are making a lot of bird food, the birds will come. But if we leave our cats outside, the cats will eat the birds. Our, our domestic and feral cats are killing between two and three billion birds a year. That's a third of the bird population killed because we have our cats outside. So that's easily solved. You put the cat inside. This one's tougher. Window strikes. We lose a billion birds a year to window strikes because we just have windows that are very reflective. We do have the technology to make unreflective windows, but they're more expensive and most people aren't going to take all their windows out. So what do we do? Here's a window at my house. Look at the reflection. Of course, the bird's going to fly into that, particularly when the sharp shin hawk is, is chasing it. Um, but this is one solution that's offered on the web. You just get a piece of plastic up here and hang bungee cords uh, out, outside. It's kind of a different aesthetic, but it really does cut down on those, those window strikes. That's what it looks like from inside. And you get used to it right away. But it's really, you know, I had uh, uh, a flicker at my suet all winter long. This was a couple of years ago. And then bam, into the window, dead. You know, just, it, it's a big, big waste. So we can solve that problem as well. OK, another grad student, Desiree Narengo, uh, who's now a postdoc in, in uh, Massachusetts, did, uh, she worked with uh, Carolina Chickadee in the suburbs of Washington, DC. And she learned a lot of things. But one of the things she learned is that there's actually room for compromise in our, our plant choices. And that's, that's good news to me. She asked a simple question. What kind of landscapes are going to sustain chickadee populations? And she compared landscapes dominated by native plants, dominated, none of them were 100% native, with landscapes that were typically uh, um, landscaped, which is about 84% uh, non-native. So when she looked at the landscapes uh, that were dominated by introduced plants, they produced 75% fewer caterpillars. So 75% less bird, bird food right away. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees. The nest boxes up in each landscape. The chickadees would come and look around and say, there's not enough food here. We're not even going to try to reproduce. If they did try, those nests contained 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. If they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings. And it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. If you put all that together in a population growth model as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plant biomass in your yard, we looked at woody plants because that's where chickadees forage. From none to 100%, this is what you get. The dotted line is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies to replace the adults that die every year. If you reproduce at this rate, that's a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, you've got a growing population. If you make fewer below this line here, you've got a shrinking, unsustainable population. So we're in a high percentage of non-native woody plants. It's a no-go. Right here is where those lines intersect. Uh, and it suggests that, liberally speaking, you can have up to 30% of your woody plant biomass non-native without destroying the local food web. That's the area of compromise that I'm excited about. So here's our friend Dan Getman. That's a ginkgo. I don't know if you picked that up the first time around. Why does he have a ginkgo in his native landscape? 
because his wife liked ginkgos and said, please put a ginkgo in. So he did. Is that ginkgo destroying the landscape? No, of course not. It's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of the native plants that, that support them. So if we increase the percentage of native plants, we can tolerate uh, a good many of those attractive non-natives. Can we use native plants in, in uh, formal designs? Of course we can. This is a Lynn O'Shaughnessy design taken from a drone 400 feet up. You don't get more formal than that. And every plant in that landscape is a native plant. So formality is a function of the, of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. And I guess that's OK, because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a, a pollinator garden into a typical suburban yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can. Put a little fence around it. It formalizes it. It tells, tells your neighbors that this is just not a patch of weeds you forgot to mow. It's beautiful when it's in bloom. It's meeting the needs of several species of, ne of bees. It's not very big. Uh, it could be bigger. But if everybody did it, it would help pollinators a lot. Why do we need to help pollinators? It is not because they pollinate a third of our crops. They actually pollinate about a twelfth of our crops. And people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. It's because they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. That's not an option. So where do we need pollinators? Everywhere we need plants, which is everywhere. How about this? Drew Latham design. Imagine the amount of life supported here versus the amount of life supported here. Seems like a no-brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Of course they can, and more and more of them are doing it. This is a uh, Minnesota kick, kicked this off several years ago with a lawn to legume program. It's a cost share program where the state is paying homeowners to reduce or eliminate their lawn and replace it with Minnesota prairie plants. Very popular. Um, an island in Florida, off of Florida, is paying people to allow burrowing owls, listed species, to burrow in the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written, with carrots rather than sticks. If you, if you have an endangered species on your property, we're going to pay you to take care of it, as opposed to fine you if you do something with your property. Everybody would want an endangered species. Bounties on, on invasive plants, calorie pears. I got to see a lot of them flying in today. Um, in in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, Fayetteville, Arkansas, the bounty on calorie pear. You take out a calorie, calorie pear, you get a free tree replacement. I think in, in South Carolina, they banned them all together. North Carolina has a bounty. Uh, again, very popular programs. Uh, public utilities are giving people $100 coupons to put in more natives that are, that are water efficient, particularly in the Southwest. And of course, the big lawn replacement programs in California, that's, that's been raised. You get a $3 per square foot rebate now for taking out lawn and putting in uh, appropriate xeric plantings. OK, I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation. And the first one's uh, important. We've come to think of nature as if it's optional. We like it. We like to visit it. But if it's optional, when resources are in short supply and, and, and push comes to shove, nature takes a back seat. Only the essential things get funded. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out. And there's this wall-sized poster there which to me epitomizes our, our society's view of conservation. We want to save wildlife, save nature, so that future generations can enjoy it. That was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for starting the, the national park system. We want to save these beautiful places so future generations can enjoy them. And, and I get that, but it suggests nature is only there for entertainment. No wonder we think it's optional. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. It's a little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. <clears throat> now, we, we talked about this. But if we restrict conservation only to the areas where there's not a lot of humans, we're going to fail, because there's not enough of, of those places left. David Quammen has a, a beautiful analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. That is a functional Persian rug. That's not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And that's what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I don't like that language, because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our road size, including our agriculture. So we've got to put the plants back, folks. We've got to glue our rug back together again, not just to make biological carters that allow plants and animals to move back and forth between viable habitats, but to create viable habitats where we've totally destroyed them. 
we can do this, and when we do it, it'll be the first time in modern history that humans are coexisting with nature. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship just to a few specialists, a few ecologists, a few conservation biologists. We didn't see it for some reason as an inherent responsibility of every human being on the planet, but I don't know why, because every human being on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody bear the responsibility of good Earth stewardship? Stan Ressworth, the Cherokee elder, once said, the Western settler mindset is, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. And I'm born with those mindsets, you're taught them. We're very good at teaching this one. We've been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to good Earth stewardship. That doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living. But you can save it where you live, and if you do, it empowers you. You know, the Earth's problems are huge, and, and so many people feel absolutely powerless. What can one person do? <clears throat> well, one person can shrink the lawn. One person can use keystone plants. One person can turn out their lights. One person can fire Mosquito Joe. One person can get rid of the invasive plants that are already on their property. We didn't even talk about that. One person can put in a pollinator garden. One person can totally revitalize the ecosystem where they live and contribute to their greater local ecosystem rather than degrade it. And it shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the earth that you can influence. If you own property, no brainer, that's where you're gonna focus. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a park, help a preserve, help a land conservancy, help a university. You know, they're all underfunded, they're all understaffed. As a volunteer, they will love you. So as a property owner or a volunteer, each one of us has the power. We certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is gonna determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own. So I think I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much.